Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, reads like this. And this I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the praise and glory of God. That's really what we desire for every student in all of the departments here at Sunset International Bible Institute. But that's what we desire for our great brotherhood. And we have such a marvelous brotherhood with so many uh, institutions of education, so many sister schools that are doing such a fine job of of equipping and training others in knowledge, in excellence, and endowing students with the fruits of righteousness. And I know that that's the goal of our sister college, uh, just over on the other side of town, Lubbock Christian University. And we are very privileged today to have Tim Perrin, who is the president of Lubbock Christian University, here to uh, speak to us today. Lubbock Christian um, and its great heritage going back even longer than, than our heritage here at Sunset International Bible Institute, maybe as many as uh, 10 years prior to the time that, that Sunset School of Preaching, Sunset International Bible Institute was established. There was a a growing school over on uh, 19th Street in Lubbock uh, training Christian people. And one of the things that some of you may not know is that Latin American Bible School, the forerunner of Sunset School of Preaching, Sunset International Bible Institute, began on the campus of that young university, that young college uh, that was growing up in southwest Lubbock. So uh, we're, we have connections that go back for many, many decades with Lubbock Christian University and with Tim, who grew up here in Lubbock. His parents were professors at, uh, at Lubbock Christian college in those days, and, and then they saw this college become a great university, and now Tim is the president of that university. Many of the people in this room have connections with that school. Uh, many of your teachers are alumni of Lubbock Christian University, and um, many of us have children and grandchildren who are students there, and some of you will become students there uh, when you finish up around here. So we're thankful to have Tim here. He is doing an excellent job at Lubbock Christian University and leading that school uh, to even greater vision in the future. So let's welcome him to the pulpit in, in our traditional fashion. (laughs) <laughs> thank you sir thank you good morning. good morning what a great thrill to get to be with you today i am so honored to be a part of this time of worship i commend you for gathering so early uh this is an impressive show of force that uh here you are and you seem relatively happy and alert <laughs> at this uh ridiculously early hour at at, uh, at lcu we we have our daily chapel at, at 11 a.m., and I think that uh, reflects the, uh, the, uh, the sense of our 18 to 22-year-olds, that that's about as early as uh, they're prepared for such a, for such a moment. But I am so thankful to be here. We love uh, Sunset Church and Sunset International Bible Institute, the great history and legacy of service to the kingdom that this place represents. So thankful for Truett and for Charles and for all those here for the chance for us be together. We are partners in eternal work, and uh, we give thanks for each and every one of you. I commend you for your choice 
to be a part of this, uh, of this effort to prepare yourselves more richly and more deeply for service in the kingdom. What could be more important than that? I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes today about one thing I know about. I, I'm intimidated being in the midst of such Bible scholars, and I'm a, I'm a history major and a lawyer. What could I possibly, a teacher of the law here before all of these uh, scholars, Bible scholars. I'm going to talk about something I know a little bit about uh, today for a few minutes, and that's Christian education. And, uh, but I want, to start, I want to start with a story from the Gospels that's, uh, that's one of the most intriguing stories for me that gets, for, gets to me into the question of, of Christian education and what it's about. There was a time when John the Baptist, you may recall that he, uh, he was not one to shy away from controversy, and uh, he, uh, there came a moment in his ministry where he spoke the truth to power. He said some things about Herod that were true, but not well received, about Herod's uh, marriage, about his conduct, and it just, it got John put in prison. You remember that, right? And he was placed in a dungeon prison by the Dead Sea. Now, just think about that for a second. Let's just stop there. When you ever got John the Baptist, I mean, who was more of a man's man than John the Baptist, right? When I think about the modern-day John the Baptist, I think about maybe Phil Robertson on Duck Dynasty. <laughs> uh, that's, my, that's, my, uh, that's my model for what John the Baptist might have been like. I mean, he kind of had that look, right? A guy that uh, could rip the head off a duck without even thinking about it. Uh, ate whatever was he could find on the land, and, uh, and spoke the truth. And there's John in prison by himself. Occasionally, he had some visitors. His disciples came to look in on him from time to time, and they would give him reports about what Jesus was doing. I remember the story, right? I mean, John the Baptist had baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, had seen the dove descend from the sky, and had heard the voice from the heavens declare that this is my son in whom I am pleased. John's in prison. And the stories he's getting about what Jesus are doing, is doing uh, are uh, perhaps not what he expected. He's hearing about Jesus uh, healing folks, and that's fine, but he's, he's spending a lot of time with the powerless or even you know, the, the tax collectors, people that were just not viewed as the kind of people you ought to be hanging with. And the kind of ministry he's hearing about Jesus that's unfolding caused him grave, it appears, caused him some serious concern. So there comes a moment when John, do you remember the story John calls, told in Matthew 11 and Luke chapter 7, where John calls his disciples to, them, to him while in prison and asks them this question. He says, Go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? It's a remarkable moment, right? I mean, just let's make sure. I mean, this is the one I was preparing the way for. I have, I have seen and experienced his, his power. I have said, I've told the people, this is the one. But go and make sure. Is he the one? I'm just having some doubts here. He's not doing what I... You know, a story of the Jewish experience in that first century with the Messiah, right? That Jesus is... The, the ministry Jesus brought, the kingdom he ushered in was not what they were looking for. He didn't bring in the political revolution against the Roman Empire. He didn't bring to bear the restoration of Israel from exile to its reign again. That's not the kind of kingdom that he was proclaiming. And so those disciples go to Jesus. Do you remember that story? Go to Jesus, and they ask him the question, John had said, to ask. And Jesus' answer, I just think, you know, when you get one of these moments in the text where you get Jesus talking about how do we know if you're the one, that's a moment to pay attention to. And I love, I love Jesus' answer. He says, go back and report to John what you see and hear. I'm in Matthew 11, chapter 11, verse 4. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. How about that? This is, he doesn't answer his, you know, Jesus' style. He doesn't answer the question directly. 
But he says, well, you can know whether I'm the one or not by what I'm doing, by what you see me doing. And look at what I'm doing. This is a, a pretty motley crew Jesus describes that he's, he's collected, right? Those who are in need, the, the lame and the deaf and the, and the leper, the outcasts of society, know who I am. Know that I am the one by what I'm doing. It, it, it echoes. If you're thinking about being a first century listener, you're hearing this. You're hearing Jesus say this. It echoes the prophet Isaiah, right? A couple of places, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 61, where we see Isaiah give this same kind of language as he describes the one who is to come, the Messiah. The way you'll know the promised one is by this kind of ministry. Isaiah 35, verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is the one who is to come. So Jesus echoes that, that familiar prophecy and says, without saying so, yes, I am the one who was to come. Go back and tell John. And then he launches into this wonderful tribute to John. In this moment of doubt, in this moment where John has shown some weakness, he says, no one is greater than John. What a powerful story here about Jesus' ministry and the kind, of, the kind of kingdom he's ushering in. Not the one we might expect, but a kingdom where people are restored, where renewal and restoration is the narrative that Jesus is bringing to bear on this earth as those in need. I mean, Jesus didn't heal everyone he encountered. We don't have a story in the Gospels of all those who had illness being healed, but those he did encounter and touched, he restored as God wanted them to be, as the creation was intended. He brought that kind of renewal and restoration. So when I think about Christian education, I start with this question of, we have to understand who Jesus is, right? We start there. That is the question. Christian Education begins with Christ and begins with understanding of who Jesus is. Who is the one who is to come? We have to start there. That is, the, and, and so often we have forgotten that fundamental principle, that fundamental point that Christian education begins with Christ. One of my, becoming one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, all of Paul's epistles, is in the, 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 the short letter to the church at Colossae in, in, in Colossians, where in Colossians chapter 1, Paul gives this incredible narrative description of who Jesus is. And, and, and I, I want to I share this with you this morning because I think it's such a powerful statement about the centrality of Jesus. It seems like an obvious thing to say, right? But the centrality of Jesus for Christians. Paul says this, starting in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Oh, there is power in those words. We, we, we are reminded that all things have their origins in Jesus Christ, that all things are held together through the power of Jesus Christ, that he was there in the beginning, that the fullness of God is manifested through the one we call the Christ. That is our story. And so Christian education is about rejecting the modern, or perhaps in 2014, the postmodern notion that knowledge is fragmented, that we can separate out what's sacred and what's secular. In fact, I've, I've started saying that really the central claim, the central distinctive of what you're doing here and what we're doing at Love a Christian is the claim that 
We refuse to separate the sacred from the secular. In fact, we believe in Jesus Christ. All things are sacred because all things have their origin in Jesus as the maker of all. And so that's a powerful claim in this world, right? We believe that knowledge is unified, that truth is found in a person. It's not a proposition. It's found in a person of Jesus Christ, fully expressed and manifested through his life. And one comes to know him. One comes to understand his ministry. One comes to see him for who he is as a risen Savior. And now one can start to understand the world. It's through his reflection. It's through becoming more like him that we have the opportunity to more fully express the reality of Jesus on this earth. So our calling, I love, always love C.S. Lewis's description of mere Christianity of the calling of the Christian is to become little Christ. And I like, I like that term, right? This is who we are as followers. We're seeking to become Christ to the world. Uh, and as we are Christ to those around us, especially to the least of these, as Jesus describes those in Matthew. As we are Christ to, the, to those who have the greatest need, to those who are the oppressed, those who are the outcast, those who have been left behind by society, we are truly Christian. And that's Christian education, is preparing students, preparing all of us, preparing our hearts for service, pursuing wisdom, seeking to discern our calling. I think those are three hallmarks of what we're doing in Christian education, is seeking to be the kind of people that are about wisdom, not just knowledge. Seeking to be faithful to the calling that we've all received from God. And seeking to understand ultimately that it's about service. And that's what, that's what this room is about. It's about understanding that we are called ultimately. The knowledge that we are able to obtain, the blessing of an education that we get, points us toward others, not toward ourselves. Points us toward service. So thank you for your example. Thank you for the powerful example of Sunset International Bible Institute and the way it embodies and lives out this high calling of Christian education to seek to become a light to the world. It's a dark, dark world. And lighthouses like Sunset International Bible Institute are so essential. Uh, my my uh, friend, the late Norval Young, who was longtime president of Pepperdine University, preached at Broadway Church of Christ here in the 1950s. He always used to say, there's no competition among lighthouses. Isn't that a great expression? There's no competition among lighthouses. And the light that shines from this place and the light that shines from Love of Christian University and all of our sister institutions that uh, Truett mentioned, this is a good thing. We need more, not less. And we don't compete with each other. We complement each other. We are in eternal work. This is ultimately important as we seek to be lights in the world. So I bring you a word of encouragement and blessing, I hope. What you're doing is important. And the challenge for all of us in this work is to overcome the trajectory of Christian education throughout time, and that is the force toward the push towards secularization, the push toward becoming less true to our mission, and inviting this 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 very recent notion that knowledge can be fragmented, that we can separate out secular and and sacred, that sacred's a private thing, to reject that, to overcome those forces, and to remain true to our missions, which is to be like Christ.